Hey, Cypher here. I just watched Mudbound, and it is startlingly dark in just the right kind of way. Netflix has had quite a few duds with their movies, but somehow they managed to produce a superb work of historical fiction here. Yes, it's fictional, but it's also based on very real situations. It follows a black and white family on a farm in Jim Crow, Mississippi, during and after World War II, which was not a nice place to be. Sometimes called the most southern state, which is meant to be derogatory because South bashing isn't considered inappropriate yet, Mississippi was the worst state for racial inequality for about a century. Just after the Civil War, they created the Black Codes. These were essentially the first attempt at Jim Crow, but even worse. The Vagrancy Act, for instance, was basically designed to force ex-slaves back to their masters. Numerous other ex-Confederate states, and even some border states, followed Mississippi's example, and it became a national issue. Radical Republicans saw this as trying to reinstitute slavery, so they pushed President Johnson to step up, but he refused. So they turned to legislating it away through further constitutional amendments and civil rights acts. The 14th and 15th Amendments were part of Radical Reconstruction, and there were three civil rights acts. Ironically, Johnson vetoed the 1866 Civil Rights Act, and a century later, a different President Johnson would sign a similar act. My fellow Americans, I am about to sign into law the Civil Rights Act of 1964. The 1860s Johnson was overridden by Congress, though. Martial law had been imposed on the South because of the Civil War, and that became the enforcing arm of this legislation. Presidents are required to execute the laws of Congress whether they wanted to or not. Reconstruction continued until 1877. White Mississippians decided to push back violently in 1874. Terrorist organizations came together better than the already broken Ku Klux Klan. They attacked prominent Republicans and freedmen. It was a reign of terror so bad that the Civil Rights Act of 1875 was passed in response. The most prolific of these organizations was formed that year, called the Red Shirts, because they all wore red. They were incredibly successful. When Reconstruction ended because of the 1876 election, Mississippi fell completely into the control of the Red Shirts, who allied themselves with the White League to spread terrorism across the South. This made way for the full institution of Jim Crow. Segregation was never so fully realized as it was in Mississippi. It took a decade before Mississippi was daring enough to push segregation beyond de facto separation enforced by terrorists. But in 1890, they were the first state to put disenfranchisement of voting rights in their constitution. This is where poll taxes and literacy tests were instituted. Now, it should be noted that states like Oregon had disenfranchisement laws predating the Civil War. Oregon was admitted as the first so-called whites-only state in 1859. Their laws banning black freemen from the state remained on the books until 1922. But we're talking about Mississippi. They enacted anti-miscegenation laws and full segregation, often before any other southern state. Blacks and whites were not supposed to interact socially. It was accepted so widely that when the Supreme Court heard Plessy v. Ferguson, they proclaimed that it was constitutional to keep the races separate but equal. That equality never came, and it was commonplace for anything designated for blacks to be significantly worse than what was meant for whites. The racial violence was equally horrid. Lynching was at its height in Mississippi. Just look at this map. That's from the Smithsonian, and here is Mississippi's borders. Yikes. They were also basically the last to abandon Jim Crow. Alabama gets much of the attention when it comes to civil rights history. Think of all the hate there is in Red China, then take a look around to Selma, Alabama. But Mississippi was just as much of a problem, if not more so. Black people moved away in droves to other states and territories. This great migration accelerated around 1915. Part of it was that trains and cars made it easier to leave the state, but there was a worse factor. 1915 is also when the Ku Klux Klan arose again, and lynchings reached epidemic proportions by 1919, all under the watchful gaze of our glorious leader. 
Woodrow Wilson. Wilson! So obviously, people sought refuge elsewhere in hopes that equality and opportunity was significantly better than Mississippi. Most of the black migrants moving from Mississippi were part of a repressive economic system called sharecropping. In fact, Mississippi was probably the first state to have sharecropping predating the Civil War. People would promise a proportion of their crop yield for loaned goods. It was exploitative in the same way that debt peonage is. It was a system that came into full usage in the wake of slavery, and most croppers were ex-slaves with no way of working themselves out of debt. If they didn't produce enough to fulfill their loans, they would be evicted and evictions were common. If they were black, that often meant ending up in prison for vagrancy. In Mississippi, these vagrancy laws fed black people into another form of forced labor. Mississippi's state penitentiary, also known as Parchman Farm, had its own agriculture and would lease their convicts to work on private farms. Black people in Mississippi lived under an oppressive system of unfree labor and racial segregation. Violation of race lines could easily end in lynching or prison. Yet, when black folks came back from World War II, they believed in a concept called the Double V. They thought fighting for victory in such a war was also fighting for a victory over oppression at home. When they returned, they learned that white supremacy would fight to maintain its hold for decades, through violence both lawful and not. The post-war civil rights movement was born in these fights. The problem did not end in the 1960s either, for white supremacy still rears its ugly head. Mudbound is based on a historical fiction novel by the same name by Hilary Jordan. Her first book, in fact. The book appears to be well-researched. There is a large preponderance of history books she could have used. My favorite is Worse Than Slavery, which is very much about the sharecropping system and Parchman Farm. It's a great book on the subject. But there is so much material out there to the point of being well beyond what one could suss out. There is another influence that is fictional, but also historical fiction. The movie basically quotes them at you. A tale of two city, Wuthering. Yeah, it's as though she took Wuthering Heights and A Tale of Two Cities and smashed them together in the middle of Mississippi. Whatever the creative process behind this film, it is set up perfectly to highlight the era's inequality. The movie follows a black sharecropper family and their local white landlords. They live in equal squalor, but social stratification remains. When World War II begins, both families send soldiers. The United States was at peace with that nation. And at the solicitation of Japan, was still... Daddy bought Mr. Robin truck to take me. With its government and its when the soldiers return, they make friends with each other, much to the chagrin of the segregationists. You ain't worth a damn, you know that? Yeah, I know Mr. that. Mr. Big, big war heroes, you, you nothing but a damn drunk. Give me a Racial tensions flare for reasons that I won't spoil and the KKK becomes involved along with the commensurate violence. Much of what I spoke of in the reality section is shown through the fiction of this film. All right, then. You're asking for a whole heap of trouble, acting the way you did at Trickle Banks earlier. Now, I know you don't want that kind of trouble. It is really powerful. In every instance, what is depicted could have feasibly happened. It is an honest tale, with the depth to ambiguate its morals. Well, we get the stock racist. You know what they call a nigga with stripes? A raccoon. <laughs> and the typical man simply trying to make his way through life. Then I reckon you best apologize. They counter and play off each other to make their positions understandable. The other characters allow for a variety of perspectives to interact. Even the internal monologues that occasionally jump out aren't annoying. For once, narration isn't boring. This movie is well worth watching, and is right there on Netflix. Especially once you know the historical context, it is that much more meaningful.